Before we get started, I've got to acknowledge the support that I get from Grasshopper, the virtual phone system that entrepreneurs love, from Shopify, where you go to create an online store in minutes, and from richwp.com, where you get a new theme for your website that you can customize. Guys, really, thanks for all the help here with these programs. All right, here's the interview. Hey everyone, it's Andrew Warner, founder of Mixergy.com, home of the ambitious upstart, and Seth Godin is the author of several business books and the world's most popular uh, marketing blog. He's also the founder of Squidoo, the publishing platform which Quantcast says has over 15 million monthly visitors. His latest book is called Lynchpin. I invited him to Mixergy to talk and teach some of the ideas from the book. And Seth, before I even ask you any questions about it, first I have to thank you. The first time you did an interview with me, I remember one of my questions for you, because my audience was just tiny, one of my questions was, why are you even doing an interview with me? But I internalized the message that you, that you gave here when you talked about tribes and how to build it up and how in the early days of building an audience, you just have to deal with the fact that it's gonna be you and maybe one other person and be grateful that other person is there and how to build up. And I did and I did and I did. I'm now looking at dozens of people who are watching us live on Mixergy, even though the hour happened to be changed, they're still here, who, thousands of people who are gonna be watching this interview and an audience that's just so supportive and helpful. So thank you for getting me here and for getting everyone else who listened to that program here too. Well, I, I'm so I have to disagree that thanks go to you, Andrew. I mean, leaders are in short supply. You stood up, you risked people laughing at you, you took a, a, a shot, and people are eager to follow you now. We owe you the thank you. So thanks for showing us how it's done. Thank you, and you know what? It's, I'm glad that you brought that up. People laughing at you, there are so many times when I think, who is watching my interview right now with Seth Godin and saying, this dopey dope Andrew with his little webcam operation, what's going on here? And one of the messages in, in this new book, in Lynchpin, is to find a way to get rid of those voices, right? Oh, you know, the voice is the problem. Let's talk about the opportunity first, because if we lead with the problem, people will turn us off. Here's the opportunity. The opportunity is that the industrial age just ended. It lasted for 200 years. The cotton gin, the assembly line, interchangeable parts, Henry Ford, the TV industrial complex, interrupting lots of people with spam and average products for average people and compliant cogs working in the factory doing what they were told. I could go on for a while. We all grew up with it. It was our lives. You sit in school in a straight row, number two pencil, filling out the little circles, no stray marks. What's that about? It's about training you to work in the factory. And then all of a sudden, the race to the bottom ended. It ended when you could buy a barrel of pickles at Walmart for $2. It ended when you could go online and buy anything in the world cheaper from someone else. It ended when Ford Motor Company laid off 10,000 innocent people who didn't do anything wrong but they lost their jobs because they followed all the instructions. And so, with all of that pain, where is the opportunity? The opportunity is we're now rewarding individuals who make a difference. We're now celebrating leaders. We're now seeking out people online and off who make things by hand or keep their promises or challenge the status quo. So the question, that the book asks is, why don't you do that? If it's so valuable and so fun and so rewarding, why don't you do that? And then we get to your question, Andrew, which is, what's with this lizard brain thing? What's with the being afraid of being laughed at? Why is it that people are afraid of public speaking and afraid to apply for a job off campus and don't know what it's like to live life without a resume? Well, there's good evolutionary reasons for it, but they're obsolete now, right? And so I've been pontificating, I'll stop, but what do you, what, go ahead. No, I'm actually, um, tell you what, let's, let's lead into it because I think I kind of gave away the, the villain before I showed the hero of the story. So let's spend a little bit more time about on what we get if we can recognize these powers. Because when you say make things by hand, that seems to me kind of small time. I've got this big dream, this big ambition, and I don't see how making these this works of art by hand is going to get me there. Um, when you say that we're all taught to conform and to and to maybe work in the factory, I don't see that in myself, and I don't see that in my audience. We want we want greatness for ourselves, don't we? Okay, first let me clarify what I mean by make by hand. Google was built by hand in 1999 or 2002. There was no book called How to Build Google for Dummies. That the model of how you build an organization used to be 
quite mechanized. I have an MBA. They taught it to me. And it's worthless. None of the steps are true anymore. That the way you build a 37 Signals now, a company that's kicking Microsoft's butt, is by hand. The way that you build a political movement is by hand. You, you can't go back and look at how Barry Goldwater did it or how Richard Nixon did it and copy the manual because the manual doesn't work anymore. So that's what I meant by hand, not carving tiki things I see. So out you of just the mean, And when you say that we're artists, when you say that we're making things by hand, you mean we're, we're, we need to be creative now. And I've got to tell you honestly, because you and I, I, I keep being honest with you here, that scares me and it doesn't make me feel like I can do it. Because It doesn't make me feel like I, I know where I'm going to go. Because right. when things are business, when things are numbers, I could sit and I could plan them out. When you tell yep. me, Andrew, you've got to be an artist, I go, artist, those are the people I laughed at on my way up the ladder, right? Those are the, the hippies who are going to make things, who are going to be creative, who are never really going to go anywhere. So now if I want to be creative and I don't have the mindset of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an artist, how do I do it? Well, let me again be really clear about my words. Pablo Picasso was an artist, but so was Bill Shakespeare. Um, but so was that guy at Goldman Sachs who figured out that spreadsheet that when you used it a certain way, created a billion dollars in value by combining certain kinds of securities in a certain way. It had never been done before. It changed things. What artists do is not paint. What artists do is put together things see the world as it is, and make change happen. And yet, almost all of us were raised to fit in, follow the instructions, and be compliant. And it's very hard to overcome it. Now, I've been living that life for 30 years and failing almost every day at it. Lucky for me, the world changed, reorganized, and made it so that being non-compliant is actually beneficial. So what I know, for example, is when I want to launch a book, the more agita I cause my publisher, the better the book's going to do, right? Both the way the book is written, the way the book is packaged, and the way the book is marketed, the more they hate it, the better the book's going to do. Because if I just fit in and follow, there's 175,000 books that are going to be marketed this year. Why pick mine? You won't. So I think you're selling yourself a little short, Andrew. You may be pretty good with numbers. I don't think you ever laughed at creative people, though. And I am certain that you have all the creativity you need to go to the next level. But I also know that the only thing holding you back is the little voice in the back of your head and the amygdala, the resistance, as Steve Pressfield calls it, the lizard brain. That voice is telling you, oh, I don't really feel like it right now. I think I should think about doing something else. That is the enemy. Seth, we talked last time about all the cre all the creative, clever ways that you've marketed your books in the past, and they always stand out in some way. I talked to so many authors here on, on Mixergy who, who would love to be that creative. They would love to have the kind of attention that you have for your book, but they don't do it, and it's not because they're not working hard enough. I see them sweat so hard to even go back and forth with me a million times to, to schedule an interview is hard work, and I'm just one, one piece of their, of, of their publicity machine but they're not being creative enough, what can they do? They can decide, right? I don't do anything secret or anything hard. I don't spend any money. The permission marketing website costs $450, and that was at the high side of what I've spent to market a book. This isn't rocket science, right? What it is is making the decision. I was talking to a guy who, who makes a, a dessert item, and he was a friend, he's doing stuff for charity, so I was giving him some free advice. And I proposed to him a totally radical package. And he and his partner came back, and they had taken all the rough edges and smoothed them out, making it worthless. Rough edges are what we pay for. Like what? It's Do you have an example smooth. of a rough edge that he smoothed out? It didn't have the name of the product on it. I see. It was just a picture, right? Because you're sitting there, and there's 20 items to choose from, and 19 of them look the same, and one has a giant picture on it. Now, if you were the first into the category, that would be a dumb thing to do. But if you're the 20th into the category and you look like the other guys, it's already over. So you might as well add some rough edges. You might as well say, okay, how do I go to an extreme, right? The kind of stuff that, you know, you McLeod wanted to be a creative artist. So what does he do? He scrawls profane cartoons on the back of business cards. Those are rough edges all the way around. And someone could say, Hugh, why don't you just make them a little bigger? 
Hugh, why don't you leave out the F-bomb every once in a while? Hugh, why don't you do this? And why We could smooth all this stuff out. And then he'd be like everybody else. What makes Hugh Hugh, what makes Andrew Andrew, is you embrace the rough edges. So when Radiohead says, we're going to get rid of the record label completely, and this, this version of the thing is free. It's not a penny or a nickel or a dollar, which the accountants would say would be a nice compromise. Burn. Zero. That is an edge. The authors who are sweating are saying, I want to work hard, but I don't want anyone to laugh at me. And Twitter amplifies this because you can now type your name into Twitter and see hundreds of people laughing at you one after another. And if that's the way you want to spend your day, it's miserable. So you need to isolate yourself from the laughter or embrace it and say, wait, this is good news. They're laughing at me. I'm on the right track. You know what, though? Ten years ago, I'm not even going to go back a hundred years. I'm not going to go back to when, when uh, Henry Ford was still around. I'm going to say ten years ago, if I wanted to build an internet company, this is exactly what I did. I said, who's out there doing it well? How can I copy their idea but put a little twist? Maybe my twist is I'm going to add another add-on to it, and that's where I made my money. At least it was a formula. I'd like a formula for creativity that would make me as clever and, stand, and help me stand out as much as Seth Godin would. And it's not just me. It's not me being uh, um, uh, all Andrew-centric. I'd like that for my audience too. Am I being too rigid in asking you to give us some kind of formula or some path where we can do this? Here's, it's, this is a very simple question to answer because you're a business guy. You understand what creates value? Scarcity. If there is no scarcity, there is no value. Right? That the reason water costs more in the desert than it costs in New Jersey is because there isn't any water in the desert. Scarcity creates value. If this is a great lifestyle and it works and anyone can do it, and I could give you a map and instruction manual, then everyone would do it. The thing that makes it scarce is there is no map. You go to art school, the real kind of art school, they don't teach you how to be Shepard Fairey or Andy Warhol or Pablo Picasso. They can teach you to draw. They can teach you to do a still life that looks like a photo. That's easy. They just can't teach you how to do the next thing. Because if they knew the next thing, they'd do it themselves. There is no map. And the people who are going to hate this book, there's two kinds of people. One, the kind of person whose lizard brain is yelling at them really loud and they're looking for someone to blame. They can blame me. Okay. And number two, the people whose lizard brain says, I need a map. The people whose resistance says, where's the how-to thing? Where's the list of bullet points? Here's what I know. I know that if I want a blog post that's going to outperform all my other blog posts, what I need to do is follow a simple formula. Formula is 10 ways you can blank, probably including the word traffic. And then among the 10 ways, I should mention Apple, Ron Paul, and talk about the distinction between men and women or black people and white people or tall people and short people, something. And then I should start a firestorm and a fight and then stand back. And my blog post will go like this. I just gave you the map. And it's worthless because once everyone does it, it won't get any traffic. And by the way, the traffic it gets you, worthless. Because those people are looking for a car accident. They're not looking for growth. They're not looking to, to exchange value. So what I'm arguing here is not that I know how you could be an artist because I don't. What I'm arguing is if you don't decide to be an artist, it's never going to happen. And if you do decide to be an artist, you're going to figure it out. I see. So it's just a matter of me here, Mixergy, trying to get a better audience and a smarter conversation here and more people watching or somebody who's watching us now who's creating a web app who wants more people on his side. Just saying, I'm going to be artistic. I'm going to be creative and I'm just going to let that come out of me. And that's going to lead to, to creativity? No, it says I'm going to fail a lot. I'm going to have a lot of bad ideas. People are going to laugh at me. I'm going to do things that don't make any sense all the way to the edges, and then I'm going to fail again. That's okay. I'm willing to do all those things because my study of every artist in history is that's the way it works. That's the map. Okay. You said something earlier that I took a note on. You said every, you were failing every day. I'm watching you from the outside. I'm watching some of the top internet entrepreneurs from the outside. I don't see you guys fail. I don't see Seth Godin flop on his face. I see 
Every day there's a new blog post from Seth Godin. Sometimes on the weekends there might even be two blog posts. I see he keeps cranking out these books. He's bringing people into his office to do an MBA program that's not a real MBA program. It's a Seth dreamt this up MBA program. Not one of them is upset on the internet because Seth screwed them over and promised something he didn't deliver. They're all la loving it. Squidoo is doing well, even though TechCrunch, I, I went and saw an old article by them saying, uh-oh, Seth Godin now is gonna prove that he's not the marketing guru and he's gonna lose that revenue new stream Skidoo's doing well where are the failures okay well the MBA program wasn't a failure because I had nine brilliant wonderful people they get all the, the credit for every blog post you read I write 10 20 30 in my head I type a few they go away those are private failures there are failures of projects that almost launch they get canceled projects that cost me a bunch there is a slide that goes in a presentation that's supposed to be really funny and it's not. There's a, a page of a book that's supposed to resonate with people. There's a chapter of a book that I work on for two months, the hardest chapter at all, and my editor doesn't get it and I have to take it out. There's the, the failure of you know some guy posting on Twitter, I don't even think this book should have been published. Well, for him, I'm a total failure. The market adds up, maybe not. That's a but small percentage. I did that. I did. I do the research. I would look for any dirt that I could find on you just to bring it up and ask you about it here. But for the most part, you don't fail in public. What you're telling me is you're failing in private. It's in the it's in the blog well, post. I'm going to interrupt head. you. I'm, this is your lizard brain talking. Okay. You're looking for an excuse, right? I started more than a hundred businesses before I had one that really worked. I was three weeks away from bankruptcy for six years in a row. I went window shopping in restaurants. I launched a videotape with fish swimming back and forth for people who couldn't have an aquarium. I had a business selling light bulbs door to door to raise money for marching bands. There's a really long list of failures. The difference is once you get going, you have enough reserve that you can fail more quietly because you can test market. You can put things into a different space. Pablo Picasso painted a lot of really bad paintings after he was Pablo Picasso. That's the privilege you get once you have momentum. But please, do not speak on behalf of your audience saying, well, Seth Godin gets to do that, but I can't because the magic genie hasn't come to me yet. Well, the magic genie didn't show up in my office. It was a really long time before we had the momentum to make things work. If you look at Squidoo's traffic, sure, we're number 100 on the Quantcast chart now, but for the first year, it was pretty quiet. And for the second year, it was quiet, but we were losing money, and we're not venture funded. So it's pretty easy to look back and say, wow, that was obvious. But if it was so obvious, why didn't you do it? I got to come up. We one day have to do an interview about how you built up Squidoo. There are too many people talking just about you and your writing, but the, the brilliance of what you were able to do there, I, I'm not seeing enough written about. Well, let's, let's focus on this book for now. You said, I think you said in the book that, and maybe this isn't a perfect quote, but I think you said everybody's a genius or everyone has genius in them. True, every one of us for the most part? Well, see, Albert Einstein ruined the whole genius thing. Because we think that to be a genius, we have to come up with a five letter equation that changes the world. That's not what a genius is. My definition is somebody who solves a problem in a way that no one expected or haven't been able to solve it. So when you were four, you solved an interesting finger painting problem. And when you were seven, you said something to your dad that no one expected that really changed the conversation. And when you were 12, you made a joke that was so funny, people wet their pants, right? But then along the way, it got drilled out of you. Along the way, acts of genius were laughed at and acts of compliance were rewarded. So we marvel at entrepreneurs who break this many rules. Well, the reason we marvel at them is we've been trained that no rules should be broken. And my point is, surely you have touched someone in a way they have not been touched. Open a conversation in a way that has never been opened before. Solve the business problem in a way that has never been solved before. Those are acts of genius. How often do you do them? You could do them more. That's what we're willing to pay you for. Okay, we've talked several times about the lizard brain. Maybe we should define it and then talk about where that comes from because it ties into what you just said. So what is the lizard brain? Okay, so it's right here. I shaved my head so you could see it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's near the top of your... Uh, spinal cord and near the amygdala and what it is is prehistoric it's been around for hundreds of thousands of years we evolved to have it it protects you from saber-toothed tigers it protects you from um, 
being thrown out of the village and being eaten by animals. It is responsible for revenge and anger and fitting in and reproduction. We have many brains. It's one of them. There's another brain that worries about breathing and another brain that worries about lust, right? And that brain, the lizard brain, is quiet most of the time. But it's aroused when the boss comes in and says, Andrew, I need you to give a speech tomorrow. And all of a sudden it's, woo, 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 don't. And Elizabeth Gilbert likes to say, and I'm, I changed a little bit, but she says, you notice that people get writer's block, but no one gets plumber's block. You know, the plumber doesn't show up and say, you know, I just don't feel like plunging your toilet. Do you have any whiskey or scotch? Maybe I could drink my way out of it. But we expect writers to act like that. My argument is that physical labor is not so good anymore. You can't make a living really with physical labor. So we get paid for emotional labor, get paid for digging deep and doing work that maybe we don't feel like. That's your job. So do the work. And the work of people like you and the people who are listening to this, the work is not to just ditto everything you hear. The work is to innovate. The work is to go to an edge and touch someone and make a connection and be generous. Once we understand that that's the work, it's a lot easier to do it. Uh, I've got a quote here in one of the documents you guys sent over before the interview. I had so many back and forth with your people. I should be paying them for all the time they're spending with me. Um, an information worker develops her skills at confronting fear. That's the work you're saying. To work on confronting your fear, that's part of the job. You know, you go to the, the counter at Delta or United, and there's 40 or 60 people behind you. And the 40 people in front of you have been hassling the person behind the counter. And you say, I know my bag weighs 52 pounds. Is there a way for we, that we can get it on? And she says, no. Is that what Delta paid her for? to be a cog, because they haven't been able to mechanize that, what would happen if she could spend exactly the same amount of time, smile at you, and say, I'm gonna learn my head to the side, why don't you unzip that bag and just take out the down jacket and wear it instead? How much would that cost her? Nothing. It's a generous act. It's an act of humanity, right? That doing that is not in the manual. Doing that requires initiative on her part. It's art. It's art because it changed you. It changed your relationship with the airline. So what we've discovered now, it's, I, in the book I quote General Charles Krulak about this, Krulak's Law. What we've discovered is the lowest paid people in the company are your marketing team now. You have all these airlines and all these ads and all these runways and all these buildings and it all comes down to one $18 an hour junior person who decides to make a connection or not with the person on the other side of the counter. Dealing with I might get in trouble for saying that. Dealing with, I don't know if that'll make my supervisor happy. Dealing with, oh, I got four more hours left in my shift. That's the work. That's what we have to do. All right, actually, I said earlier that I was talking to several of your people, but it was just one person who acted like several people. Her name was, tell me if I'm mispronouncing her name, it's Ashita Gupta, right? Yep. She's phenomenal. There, there are few of you who talk about how to interact with people, and I always will pay attention to the people who work for you guys. You, Gary Vaynerchuk, a couple of others, and I pay attention to the people who work for you guys. Say, are they really snowing the public? And then when I'm under the hood, I see where the dirt is. No, she's phenomenal. So if you don't mind, how do you? What's your relationship to her? How is she so phenomenal? What's the deal here? Because I'd like okay. to be able to have people like that on my team. Ashita does not work for me. I work for Ashita. The deal, she was one of my MBA students. And when the, the semester ended, I asked her to, to come on as head of Hoopla for this project. And what I said is, you're in charge. You're the head of Hoopla. Tell me what to do. And I work for her. She says, you're going to talk to Andrew. I show up. And so you start by hiring somebody who loves to be like this, not someone you have to tell to be like this. And then you completely get out of the way. You get out of the way and say, you are better at this than I am. And that's the secret of Squidoo, by the way. Six people, all of whom are better at what they do than I am, so I don't bother them. And I work for her. If I can support what she's doing, that's my job. It is not my job to tell her what to do, because then she becomes a compliant cog in the factory of Seth Godin. That's not the deal. I see. OK, all right. Um, let's go back to the lizard brain. How do you stop it? You get this thought in your head. You're, you're sitting down to, to, 
to create the next web app, a thought comes in your head and you go, that Jason Freed had an interesting blog post the other day. He's probably whipping these blog posts out in his sleep and then waking up and create and just churning out profitable web apps. I can't compete with him. Now intellectually, you know, that's nonsense. You're not really competing with him. You're in your own world with your own customer base, but you can't stop that thought. How do you do it? Well, I'd start with Steve Pressfield's book, The War of Art. <clears throat> where he talks about the resistance. This resistance is nefarious. It will never give up. It will use every opportunity it can to find an excuse to get you to yak shave, to spend three more hours checking your status on all these social networks just one more time to make sure you're right in the right emotional moment to move forward. And then you know its name and you know its tactics and you know how it does its job. And you're smarter than that. So if it's important to you, you beat it. What did Isaac Asimov do? He wrote 400 books in his career, right? 40 times as many as me. How did he do it? Every morning he woke up at 6 o'clock and he wrote till 10 a.m. and then he was done, right? Robert Parker just died. He wrote the Spencer novels. Every day, day in and day out, he wrote five pages. That's all, five pages. That's how he beat the resistance. He can spend as much time as he wants at the keyboard, but he cannot get up until five pages are done. There's a million ways to beat the resistance. After all, it's 100,000 years old, it's very primitive. You just gotta decide that that's your job. Once you decide that that's the job, you'll figure out how to beat the resistance. If I tell you how I beat it, it will not help you. You I, have to beat it your way. Maybe it will, actually. Do you mind telling no, us? You can't tell us. I'm not gonna tell you. Because Sorry. it's too embarrassing? Because it takes away from from no, the personality you're projecting? because then you'll be following my map. Then you'll be following my manual. And when it doesn't work, you know what the resistance is going to say? Idiot. You're following Seth Godin's book. He's a jerk. Don't listen to him. And then you're stuck. What I'm forcing you to do, trying to force you to do, is sit quietly in an empty room. Confront it. Deal with it. Live with it. Talk to it. And figure it out. If you don't figure it out, no tool, no rule book is going to help you. A lot of this sounds like meditation techniques. I went on a meditation retreat where they forced me not to talk for seven or so days. And they taught me about the monkey brain, they called it. By the way, you name things, right? Like lizard brain. I'm going to be talking about lizard brain with my wife tonight. And we're going to be talking about it in the chat room. And you did it intentionally, right? Well, I didn't invent the lizard brain. It's from something called triune theory. You can check in Wikipedia. Okay. But yeah, I name stuff all the time because... If there isn't a name for something, we will be unable to take action on it. If permission marketing didn't have a name, you couldn't go to a venture capitalist and say, I'm starting a permission marketing company. If idea viruses didn't have a name, what would we have called them? They're not viral marketing, it's a noun, right? So by naming things, I'm providing a service. And the service is, I want us to have a conversation, let's just agree to call it this, go, talk among yourselves. I think that's pretty valuable. It's not particularly difficult and other people should do it too name things come up with their own names where possible so yeah. they own it okay so a lot of this is does sound like what you hear on meditation retreats true is yes meditation was invented to deal with the resistance it was invented to deal with our need for reassurance that one of the things the resistance does the lizard brain does is it always wants you to tell it everything will be okay it always wants to hear that bad things aren't going to happen because of your art and so this constant need for reassurance never ends, and it, it actually escalates. And the magic of meditation when done properly is if you can live with the empty space, you discover you don't need reassurance. And if you don't need reassurance, you're more willing to do stuff that might get you laughed at. The twist here is that some meditation goes so far as to say, and in fact, you shouldn't even try to accomplish anything. Just be. Mm. And in a capitalist world, that's frustrating. And I think that for an artist, that's frustrating. Because no, you shouldn't just be. You have an obligation to do the work. And you have to do the work even if it gives you a stomach ache, even if you're not gonna get to sleep tonight. Doing the work is more important than you getting to sleep tonight. Doing the work is something that I saw in a lot of the, the um... A lot of the reviews, a lot of, you had a lot of readers review the book before you, I love the way you release your books. I would study just the way that you work instead of, instead of going to school. Um, another thing they said was, uh, as far as books, they kept recommending The War of Art, which I love. I, I, I can't stop recommending it too. And 
shipping. Seth Godin ships. I kept seeing over and over again. You've got. I think your website's a little out of date. It says that you have that you published ten books. I don't think your website can keep up with how many books you published. Is it twelve now? Thirteen. Well, the reason it's hard to keep track is I used to be a book packager, inventing ideas for books, working with a team of ten people, and shipping. We did hundred and twenty or so books over ten years. So the transition from one to the other isn't really clear. I don't know how many books I wrote. That's not part of the gig is keeping track. So how do you produce so much? Is it that you sit down and you say, every day I'm going to write five pages? Is it that you have your own version of that? You're trying to trick me into telling you how I deal <laughs> with the resistance. All right. Well, one thing I'll, I'll tell you is this. I refuse to start something unless I'm prepared to finish it. Now, by start, I don't mean brainstorm it. I don't mean prototype it. I mean, after that, there's a day. And on that day, it's, is this good enough to be a book? Is this good enough to be a website? Is this good enough to be a blog post? Yes or no? If it's no, I throw it out and I never think of it again. And if it's yes, I will not stop until it's done. Right? So I can write a book in three weeks. I didn't write this book in three weeks, but I have written other books in three weeks. Because if you don't watch TV, and you don't go on Twitter, and you don't go on Facebook, and you don't go to meetings, which I don't, there's a lot of time especially if you write like you talk and you refuse to let the resistance get in the way of what you're saying. So it's not that people have trouble writing or painting or doing customer service. It's that they don't want to because leaning into it all the way, all the way is painful. It's scary. And so you got to decide, is that what you're going to do for a living? If not, go work at 7-Eleven. It's safer. Okay, now your concern was earlier that you've just said one of the techniques that you use. The concern is that somebody's going to listen to us and say, once you start and commit, you can't stop. And then 30, 40, 50 years into it, they're going to look at their lives and go, I wasted my life because of that Seth Godin. That's the thing. They've got to find their own tactic. Right. And to get to here, you had to try a bunch of other tactics that you failed at. Exactly. You know, I, I was born with ADD. I still have it. Uh, and in the old days, that was horrible. I mean, everybody hated people with ADD. We were obnoxious in class. We were obnoxious on the airplane. Everywhere you looked, you just didn't want someone with ADD around. Well, the internet is great because now it's cool to have five screens and you're doing this and flitting from this to this. But one of the things that people with ADD do for self-preservation is they force themselves when something's important to become laser focused. And so it ends up being this great benefit that you had to go through the process of learning how to do that. And now I'm lucky I live in an ADD world, so it all worked out for me. But if I had been born 20 years earlier or 20 years later, it probably wouldn't work. I, uh, I, all right, it's still a challenge for me. I, I actually read a post by Paul Graham, the, the guy behind Y Combinator, who said that he has a separate computer that he goes to when he needs to get work done. And I tried that, but it's impossible, because then I need to go check email, or I need to research the, the interview I'm about to do with you. I need, a, I need a solution, and like you're saying, it's in my head. It's not in my hands. It's not in my exactly. computer. Exactly. All right, let me challenge you on this other thing. Uh, Seth, does it ever get a little annoying that I'm so craving education, but at the same time challenging? Do you ever go, what is this guy doing here? Leave me alone. You either like what I want to say, or you don't, but quit challenging me, challenging me here. You're so wrong. This is such a gift you're giving me. So few people are willing to stand up and say, I read what you said. I respect where you're coming from. Let me tell you where I'm stuck, where I disagree. Teach me. Very few people are that generous and that brave. And it means the world to me that you're doing it. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for understanding and for coming at it this way. Otherwise, I would look like a jerk. This way, hopefully, you could see that I've got the curiosity of a child. And, and here's where my childish curiosity goes. You talk about giving is... I'm going to paraphrase it. Giving is a new receiving. That years ago, it was all about how much can you receive and accumulate. Now it's how much can you give to the world. I kind of like the old days where it's how much can I accumulate Is there something wrong with me? Yeah, I'm afraid so, Andrew. Okay. We I'm, don't exa have I'm exaggerating for effect here, but. We don't have the whole history lesson, time for the whole history lesson, but here's the short version. Why do you want to accumulate stuff? My guess is you want to accumulate stuff because it makes you feel good, not because you need it, because you want it. You want to accumulate stuff because it gives you a sense of stability and security. And that there's a cultural thing that if you can accumulate in a lot of stuff, people think you have power, right? Well, in the Pacific Northwest, the Native Americans had a tradition called potlatch, where the chief would give away everything he owned, everything. 
And there were wars of potlatch where people were competing to see who could give away the most. Why? Because if you can give away everything, you must have a lot of power because you're not even worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. And on the internet, a world of digital goods where accumulating more stuff isn't worth very much because it's all bits. Guess what the most valuable thing to accumulate is? Respect, attention, people who think they owe you something. This idea of people opening themselves to your idea. That's where power lies, that's where joy lies now, unlike 10 or 15 years ago. That if we think about someone like Cory Doctorow, who's written 55,000 posts on Boing Boing in 10 years, right? Corey's the, one of the most powerful people on, in the world. Not because we all mail him gifts. He'll never have trouble making a living, ever. But anywhere Corey goes in the world, he has a bed to sleep. He has someone who'll shuttle them somewhere, him somewhere. He has people who will believe him when he says something. Corey can say, I hate Canadian copyright law. Everyone, go write to this guy. And we do. Right? Why? What happened? Well, he gave to us relentless, persistent, over-the-top generosity, day after day after day, with nothing expected in return. He didn't say, I'm going to do this for 10 years, then I'll get elected. No, he just does it, because it's a privilege. It's a privilege for me to write a blog post that even four people are going to read. I would never run ads on my blog. How stupid would that be, to pimp out my audience for 100 bucks? No. This is my, pr my, my pride and joy, that people are trusting enough of me that in the morning they'll tune in to see what I have to say. Thank you so much for letting me give you this. And that is where we're headed as a culture, that the people who can give the most get what really matters, which is peace of mind, the ability to do their art, the ability to leverage their genius and make change in the world. That's the new economy. Working for Ford Motor Company in Detroit, on the assembly line, putting widget A into widget B, that is not a job with good prospects. At the same time, you can't take you can't take reputation to the grocery store. When you're dying to travel to another country, you can't use reputation to fly you out. And we might come up with a few examples of people who've done that, but for the average person listening to us, it's not feasible. And when we look at accumulating, I don't mean accumulating more furniture or more cars in my life, but I was pretty impressed when I saw that Squidoo had a big audience. I was impressed that I have Seth Godin and other smart thinkers who I respect on Mixergy. And I do want to accumulate more of those. And to that, to, in those senses, doesn't it make sense to accumulate money so you could afford to pay for the things that you want, to accumulate traffic, attention, and all the other things? I'm not down on money. I think money's fine. So let's say you're a programmer and you want more money. Well, one model is go to work every day, be Dilbert. The other model is focus as much energy as you can to get as many lines of code as you can into the Linux kernel, right? For free, give the code to the Linux kernel. Or write a piece of shareware that's free that gets used by, I don't know, four million people on their Mac to take screenshots. Be generous. Tell me, honestly, Andrew, do you think that person's ever gonna have trouble getting a good job? Yeah, we can see evidence of it every day that they don't. Exactly. Now, Shepard Ferry. Rhode Island School of Design. Lots of people went to art school with him. Can you name anyone else who went to art school with Shepard Ferry? I can't. How did Shepard Ferry make it so that he's making over a million dollars a year? What's his strategy exactly? Right? His strategy is posters everywhere, free art everywhere. Here, go, take it. Go down the list. I'm talking about programmers and architects and designers and people who know how to use a pen and people who know how to write and people who know how to build things and people who know how to build sustainable businesses. I'm talking about Paul Graham. You mentioned Paul Graham. What's in it exactly for Paul Graham that you read what he wrote? Well, let me, let me suggest this. I've talked to several entrepreneurs who drove miles just to see him and share, his, uh, share their ideas with him with the hope, some of them, that, that he invests, but others just so he'll bless their ideas because, or just to spend some time listening to him. He's able to transfer that into a business Yeah, model, that's right? my point. Paul, Paul Graham calls you on the phone and says, Andrew, I want to invest in your company, right? Do you do due diligence on him? Do you check over three times? You just take the money. You take the money. Is he able to get a better investment rate because he's Paul Graham? Of course he can. That's money, right? Where did the money came from? It came as a souvenir of his art. 
right? It came because his reputation made him more valuable to be part of what you do. It came because that guy who's got lines in the Linux code, you trust him more as a good programmer because he's proven himself. So <clears throat> we either fool ourselves into thinking the only way to make money is to sell out and do what we're told, or we make money by being exceptional, by being indispensable, by being someone they can't live without. And my argument, and I think I got lots of evidence to back it up, is that the first is on a downhill slide. That first category gets paid less. In my presentation last week, I showed a chart. Hourly wage adjusted for inflation from 1960 to present for untrained workers, you know, burger flippers. <clears throat> 1960, they made $15 an hour. Now, they make $15 an hour. Zero change in 49 years. That's a lousy bet. I don't want to take that bet. You're, you're changing minds here in the audience. First of all, here on the other side of the, of the video camera, but also in the audience, I see, um, I, I won't even start reading each individual one, but I see you're, shape, you're reshaping people's view of art, of creativity, and uh, I, I love seeing this feedback. We have about two, three more minutes left. I'll just ask, where did the idea for this book, for Lynchpin, come from? The answer to the question, where do good ideas come from, is always the same. They come from bad ideas. If you come up with 20 bad ideas, you'll have a good idea. I have a lot of bad ideas. I have more bad ideas than anyone I know. I'm in the bad idea business. <clears throat> and part of my skill is throwing out the bad ones and whatever's left is interesting. I don't write books to make a living. I don't write books because I like it. Writing books is exhausting and it's nerve wracking and it's pain in the neck and it's not lucrative. I write books because I have to. <clears throat> I had to write this book because I was hearing from people by email who were in pain, who were upset, who had bought the deal and it wasn't working. They had seen the strategy. They'd heard strategies I talked about for companies. And now some of those strategies weren't working where they were working. And they wanted to know why were they getting a pay cut and why are they so unhappy. And I realized I couldn't talk about strategy anymore. I had to go grassroots, bottom up, and talk about people. Because if we don't have people with right intent, no strategy is going to pay off. And so this is a passionate work for me. I haven't written a word of a new book since July when I stopped writing this one. I have nothing left. This is all I have to say. But if I could just get one person to decide to change their perspective because I wrote this, it will be worth all the pain and suffering. Just one person. It's not – you don't have a number in your head that it has to be a bestseller. No. Just one person. Bestsellers are – a figment of the New York Times imagination. It's an easily gamed system that has no bearing on reality. All right. Well, let's leave it there. I want to be fair with you at the time. Thanks for being so generous and giving me more time, I think, than we originally talked about. Um, so thank you for being here, Seth. This won't be the last time that I'll have Seth Godin on. I'm going to keep asking questions like this, and I'm so grateful to you for, for, for taking it the way that I present it. Thanks, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the comments. Thanks for what you do, Andrew. I really appreciate it.